pray we'll get to work. God, thank you so much for your grace. Um, we talk about your goodness running after us, which is a weird way to put it, but I think that's what it is. Blessing and kindness and mercy and goodness and these things, and you're the one in pursuit. We're not that often pursuing you. And we look at Scripture and we see again and again and again your pursuit of us. And that's just remarkable. And that is a gift of grace and you deserve credit, glory, and honor for it. Thank you, thank you for that. Thank you for loving us through our ups and downs. Thank you for loving us through the peaks, the valleys. God, I pray that today is... Um, a day that, that might stand for some of us as a, as, a, as a marker. Looking back at this day, it may be a, a, a point in our own story where you um, engaged us and we had ears to hear and eyes to see and we responded and that today would be that kind of a banner day for us, a marker day. As we step back into the book of Genesis, God, I pray that you meet us in this space and the subject of covenant, would, would, uh, we'd look on it with new eyes and with the freshness and it would have great effect on us. I know I'm, uh, that's a big ask. I know, probably bigger than I realize. But God, would you meet us in this space? Would you... Would your goodness run after us in this season of our church? And would you overtake us? Would you keep us? It's in Jesus' great name that we pray. And those in agreement said, Amen. It's been a long time coming, but we're back in the book of Genesis this morning, and looking back, it was never intended to be preached from beginning to end in one series. The book has 50 chapters, it's long, we expected to dice it up, possibly into three different parts, the first part being the first 11 chapters, and the second part being up through the patriarchs at least, maybe up to Joseph, and then maybe a third part around the story of Joseph on to the end of the book. So, the, the intention was never to, once we started it, we were going to run clean through it. But nevertheless, we ended up breaking from it more often than was even originally intended. So if you've been around here for some time, there's been kind of a start-stop kind of rhythm with the book of Genesis. Uh, it's a big book to tackle. But looking back at the archives, I was like, okay, when did we start part one? 2016. I looked at the date of the first sermon in that series. I went, 2000, are you serious? It's been that long. 2016, we started the first 11 chapters of Genesis, which is a typical dividing point for scholars when you talk about the structure of the book of Genesis. So we were going to bite off the first 11 chapters in a series about origins. And we just talked about the origin of a variety of things. And then we started part two in 2019. And we were going to pick it up from chapter 12 and move on. And this is where the history for us gets a little foggy. And I tried to sleuth it out, and I couldn't really. So we're preaching in, let me see, 2019, we start this study. And then for some reason, we broke away from it in March. And for the life of me, I couldn't figure out why. It was right at Easter. We stepped away from our study to talk about the resurrection. We were at Easter time, and we were preaching accordingly, and... And we never went back to Genesis after Easter. And I'm like, why? And I'm looking back at past series. What were we doing? What was happening in the life of our church? I couldn't piece it together. We didn't pick the study up again until 2020. And then it went a few weeks. And then, well, you know how that year went. And I don't much want to talk about it anymore. Uh, so it's just, it, it just had this rhythm of, of start and stop. And then by God's great grace and provision, I've been in class and I've been re-engaging with school in this season, which has been just life-giving to me as a pastor. Uh, I love the classroom, and so I just took a, 
uh, just finished an Old Testament hermeneutics class, which was the hardest class I've ever taken in my adult life. Um, but I, it's probably my favorite class I've ever taken. Um, it was so engaging and exciting for me. I was like, we need to get back to Genesis. We need to get back to Genesis. And I started to have a fire in my belly. And so we wrapped up Ephesians and, and here we are. So uh, it's been a while. And so I figured I'd take one sermon. I was going to give myself one sermon where I would do kind of the recap work and get up through the first 18 chapters, which is where we left off. And I mean, that's a big task, but I don't want to take a bunch of Sundays. It's online. If you're interested, you can go back and whatever point you want to hear more about, it's all online. You can go get it. Uh, But I want to reacclimate us to where we were at because there are important images and themes I want to make sure that we take with us as we pick it up again. And it's been a couple years. And it's been a crazy couple years. So we have to at least step back into where we have been and pick up a few things so that we have them with us again, blow the dust off them a little bit, and then continue to take them with us as we move forward in the study. So that is my aim. So we're not going to do a deep dive today in those first 18 chapters. There's no time for that. This will be like skipping a rock across the pond. It's going gonna, it's gonna to hit on a few of the high water marks. I want to make sure we re-engage with so that as we continue into chapter 19, we have those close at hand. And, and they've been freshened up, so to speak. So that is my aim today. And um, I, I don't know how many of you were even here in 2016. The number of people that have been added since is quite significant. So some of you probably weren't even here, let alone the rest of you. Like, can you remember what I preached two weeks ago, let alone back in 2016? So uh, that's the hope for the morning. Um. I don't know if you'll remember this. this. This will go back a couple of years. But this is how we started part two of the series. I pulled out this map and, I, and I, said, I said this. I used it to illustrate the world that we live in. That there is this sense in which our world, as we observe it, either on the news or we watch it in um, our workplaces, we watch it on social media unfold and, and all of these things. Our world has a map out. And they're working to chart a course. And they're working to figure it out and try to answer the question of what it means to arrive and what are we here for, purpose, meaning, belonging, all of that stuff. We look out at a world that's pretty sure they've got the answers. Pretty sure they got it figured out. At least they think. But but they're they're missing something. And it's, it's, it's quite important. They have no idea where they are. And how well can you chart a course if you don't know where you are? It doesn't matter how detailed the map is. If you don't know where you are, it's of no help to you. It's, uh, assuming you still go to the mall. I don't know. I, every time I go in there, and it's typically just around Christmas time, um, it, the, you know, it, the place is looking more and more abandoned these days. And it, mostly, I think it's now just a fitness club. A bunch of people go in there just to walk. I don't know what that's <laughs> about. I guess it's safe and it's dry. So uh, I guess you don't need a directory to go in and just walk. You're not there to shop. You're just to walk. Okay, I get that. But let's say it's an amusement park or some other um, outlet mall or some sort of situation where there's a lot being offered and it's a big sprawl and you don't know where everything's at. What, what's the first thing you look for? So usually at the main entrance somewhere, there's a big map, a directory, and what's the first thing you look for on that map? Where am I on this thing? And then I can figure out what store I'm looking for. Okay, I got to take a right, and then I got to take a left. Okay, there we go, and then you go. Okay, that that's that's typically how we how we do it. How it works. You can't chart a course when you don't know where you are. And you look around at all of these people in the world, people who claim to be experts and and have all these letters after their name that seem to suggest that they're experts or that they're in the know. And they're frantically trying to make sense of a thing without knowing their origin. They don't know where they are. Now, this should not be surprising to us. But this is the way that it has always been. 
And so they're frantically trying to figure out where, where they are. Now, we don't use maps anymore. I kept this. It's been on my desk for two years on my credenza, and I had it. I, I, go, I know I kept the map. Where did I put it? I was tearing my office apart trying to find it, and I found it uh, in with all of my uh, theology books for the book of Genesis. It was tucked in. I kept it with the books for Genesis. Oh, there it is. I remember why I kept it. Because I remember how hard it was to find one. It used to be you could go to any, at any cash register, at any department store, any grocery store, you could pick up a local map, right? Any gas station, you could be. I couldn't find one. I can't remember where I found it. So I said, man, I'm going to hang on to that. Because anymore, we got our smartphones. You know, hey, Siri, you know, where, I need directions to the whatever. And then someone with an accent tells us how to get somewhere. And, and that's how we do it. But even Google Maps can't help you if what is not turned on. Your location. Now, I know there's a lot of you in here. It's like, oh, of course I don't have my location on because I don't want the government spying on me. They don't need to know what I, I'm off the grid. You're not as off the grid as you think you are, first of all. <laughs> okay. But Google Maps doesn't work if, it, if your location isn't on. I can't give you directions if I don't know where you are. Okay, what's the point? The point is that Genesis is the book by virtue of its name, the beginnings, Genesis. Genesis is our origin story. It is, it is functionally and literally the you are here on the map. It's location turned on on our smartphone. This is like, this is where you are. This is the story. And when did, when did God give us the book of Genesis? And we've, scholars have identified, historians have identified that Moses is the one who gave us the book of Genesis, which puts it on the timeline. Moses led the people out of Egypt. They'd been bonded, in bondage in Egypt for 400 years, living in a country that wasn't their own, with a completely different understanding of how the world works, a different economy and how we function within it as human beings. And what are ex interpreting our experiences, our worldviews? They had a, a myriad of uh, pagan gods and deities that they worshipped. And this is where the Israelites were for 400 years as slaves. And so what does God do? God sends Moses to deliver them. He carries them out. And you know the story. You've seen Charlton Heston, the beard, and the, you know, all that stuff. And God leads them out and he gives them their origin story. This is what you've heard for, four, for 400 years. Let, let, let me show you where you really are. Let me show you, more, more importantly, who you are. And he corrects, steps in, engages them, and corrects theology, corrects their understanding of cosmology, and just steps in and engages them in that space and gives them this important thing that they need on the map, the you are here. This is your story. Church, listen to me. That didn't just function for them that way. It functions today for us in that same way. For we too live in a country that, let's be honest, is not our home and does not share our values nor the same origin story. Doesn't matter how much you want to tout our history and raise up your favorite histori historical character and go, no, 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 he, he, he. Okay, yeah, 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 I get all that. I don't want to disrespect it. I want honor to go where honor is due. I'm just saying that this is our world today. Oh, yeah, this is how you should think. This is where we're going. And they call it progress. And I'm telling you, and you've seen this, I don't need to tell you, we don't value the same things. We don't value the same things because we don't share an origin story. It's an altogether different origin story. So we've charted a course from that you are here. That's not where we are. See, it's just, it's just fundamentally different. You should not be surprised that you don't fit. You should not be surprised that the world looks differently than you think it should look. If you're a God-fearer, if you're a Christian, this world is not going to fit. And you're not going to make it fit, 
no matter how hard you try, it's not going to fit. It doesn't value the same things that you, I hope, are increasingly are valuing. Scripture says plainly in 1 Peter chapter 2 that we are aliens and strangers here. This is not our home. Uh, Paul says we are citizens of heaven and we eagerly await a savior from there. That this is not our home. We are foreigners here. It's, it's not going to fit. So um, it's, it's interesting to me that here we are picking up the book of Genesis after a couple of years of s- having stepped away from our study. And I'm going, man, it is more relevant today, it seems, than when I was preaching at you two years ago. Like, I look back at my notes as I'm looking back a couple of years and just looking at what are some of the things I was saying, some of the application I was making, some of the ways I was connecting it to culture. And I'm looking back and going, man, that's more true today than it was under Patrick. You had no idea what you were talking about back then. And I expect that the Patrick from two, two years from now is going to look back on the Patrick today and go, you still didn't. And I'm going to go, I know, I'm just always playing catch up. But it's amazing to me that we can pick up a study after walking away from it for two years and, and see the political and social climate and go, oh my word, isn't this going to be timely? Well, it was timely then, it's timely today, and guess what, in two years from now, 10 years from now, 50 years from now, it's going to be timely. Why? Because it's your origin story. It's the you are here on the map. This is the trailhead. And the trailhead is not going to change. I I said it before. I'll say it again. I don't think it's possible to overemphasize the value of the book of Genesis. I just don't. If you've been here, if you go, yeah, I remember we did that. You've been here since 2016 or even longer. Um, You know how often I reference the book of Genesis at some point in nearly every sermon. It's typically we find ourselves in Genesis chapter 3 and a lot. But Genesis always gets referenced. Why? It's the trailhead. It's the you are here on the map. It's going to continually be referenced. It's, I don't think it's possible to overemphasize the value. It, it is foundational. It lays the framework by which we build what it is that God is trying to build. And again, it does not share the values with the world. It doesn't. It hasn't ever. And it will never. Two families, two kingdoms, they don't agree on how things should go. The course they've charted on their map, it's entirely different with different trailheads. And it's going to a different place um, I said, and it's weird, I'm going to quote myself. Is that weird? Okay, I'm going to quote. This well-known scholar once said, <laughs> no. I, I, rem- I remember saying back when we started part one, that's 2016, I said this, and I think it's true. You can't wrestle with things of origin and not end up with your hands on timeless universal things. We can't step into Genesis to the trailhead, start wrestling with how the things came to be and not find ourselves meddling with and wrestling with things that are timeless, things that are always going to be relevant. And I think that that's true. So basically, when we think about the book of Genesis, and I I hope this isn't too reductionistic, but back then a couple years ago, I actually wrote on it. You may have noticed already. I wrote, you are here. This is how we started part two of the series. So I wrote, you are here, and then I charted a course. So here's the trailhead, and God has charted a course. You can see that course, and you can pick it up, and there are clues everywhere. I mean, we've talked about those. I can't expand on those this morning, but you you look at all of these points throughout Scripture where God has um, exposed and showed the cards, so to speak, of what he's doing. These high watermarks in the story of God where you're like, man, he is charting a very specific course through history to a very specific destination. And it is a part of our story. I hope that excites you. I know we're all at different places in our spiritual journey, but that should excite you. This is your story. You're a part of it. God has intentionally invited you to be a part of this narrative that's been standing for thousands of years. Whew. 
It's big. It's big. Scholars refer to this sort of weaving, this charting of the course, this, this theme that seems to be threaded through, woven into all of Scripture. They refer to it as the echo. And I think that's right. Multiple scholars have referred to it as the echo. There's an echo in here. Something happens in Genesis where a chord is struck and the vibration of that chord works its way out through the rest of Scripture and into our own lives. There's an echo in here. And the echo at its crescendo is Christ. John Sailhammer wrote a very big book that can double as a paperweight. Uh, it's a book I have difficulty getting my brain around. Like I'm reading John Sailhammer and I go, you are such a smart person and I feel really dumb trying to understand this book. But he wrote a book called The Meaning of the Pentateuch. What's the Pentateuch? It's the first five books of the Old Testament that Moses' is, is, is scholars understand the, the author of. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And that, this is the meaning. And he talks about this echo. And he said this. The whole of the messianic message of the Old Testament. When we say messianic message, you're talking about the Messiah. Who's the Messiah of Scripture? Jesus is the Messiah of Scripture. And he says the whole of the messianic message that begins in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 is the function of the echo. Meaning that the whole purpose this echo exists is to point to Christ. So you see that in scripture. It goes through the Pentateuch. It goes through the narratives. It goes up through the chronicles of the kings. It goes through the poetic texts of the Psalms. It goes through the wisdom texts of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. You can see it up through the prophets. You can see it, it this echo ringing through these various books. And they crescendo at Christ. You'll notice that in the Old Testament, much of the Old Testament document that we have points forward to the event of Christ. Now, depending on how familiar you, you are with that Old Testament block of Scripture or the New Testament block of Scripture, what does the New Testament do after Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? After the Gospel account of Jesus' life on earth, what do the remaining books of Scripture do? They point back continually, continually point back to the cross. So you have everything before the cross is pointing to it. Everything after is pointing back at it. And so uh, uh, Piper was right when he said, I, I think, when he said, the cross is the blazing center of Scripture. The blazing center of the gospel is the cross. And that is, according to Selhammer, the function of the echo is to get us to Jesus. It is fantastic. And so you follow that thread through the Old Testament. You see it in the covenant with Abraham. You see it in the covenant uh, with Moses, with David. All of these high watermarks where you go, who is that really about? Who is that pointing to? Who's that about? Well, who, who's that? That echo is all about Christ and the messianic message that would ultimately point to Jesus. It's, it's phenomenal. And Genesis is the first to strike the cord. It's the trailhead. And then God charts a course from there. And it is phenomenal. So again, I do not think, maybe you've picked up on this already, but I do not think it's possible to overemphasize the value of the book of Genesis. It's the trailhead. So let's reacclimate. There's no way to preach 18 chapters of Genesis in one sermon. So I'm going to look at a theme. I'm going to unpack a theme and show you that that theme just repeats itself in 18 chapters. That's how we're going to do it. So it's just going to allow us to move very quickly. Okay? And if you want more or have questions, you can come talk to me or I can, you can go back and jump to those sermons online and get more. If there's any of those gaps that you feel weak on and would like more in. Okay? Here's the theme. In part one of our story, I shared with you how one particular theologian, Dr. Bruce Walke, and he was, I remember sitting in a workshop with him many, many years ago, and he was the quintessential professor 
right? Like he's standing there, you know, old guy leaning on his podium. He had mustard on his tie and his tie was crooked and he's pointing a crooked finger and he's just talking. You're like, this guy is brilliant, right? Okay, he said this, and this, uh, this is from his Old Testament theology book, which is phenomenal. Um, he said this. This sums up the theme of Genesis. God erupting into chaos to establish his rule over everything. Now, when we first jumped into this uh, study, some of you were quick to want to correct my spelling that was a typo on the screen. I'll admit, when I first read it, I thought I found a typo in a smart guy's book, and I felt impressed with myself. Uh, But my vocabulary was expanded that day, and studying that out sort of helped me see a distinction in Scripture. Um, and that's the theme I want to latch on to. So, there's actually two different words. Um, it, it erupt with an I and erupt with an E. And that was the typo I thought I caught. It's like, that's a misspelling. No, two words, different prefixes. Erupt with an I means to subtly and forcefully break in. Erupt with an E is to forcefully and suddenly break out. So we think about a volcano erupting. You think of something from inside just building up pressure and bursting out suddenly and forcefully. To erupt with an eye is to forcefully and suddenly break into something. So he is saying that God, in looking into the void of um, what was or wasn't, we say ex nihilo, that God created out of nothing, and yet there's a formlessness that was there. He speaks into that disorder, into that chaos, into that formlessness. He breaks in and establishes order. So he erupts with an eye into disorder and formlessness and brings order and form. Okay? To do what? To establish his rule over everything. So you see that in in the Genesis 1 account, don't you? We can make it. I just got to quit getting so excited. (coughs) Excuse me. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, it says, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And what did God do? And God said, let there be light. He erupts with an eye, breaks in suddenly and forcefully, and begins to bring order and distinction to disorder and chaos. And you see that unfold in Genesis 1 and Genesis chapter 2. And then Genesis chapter 3, this is an important part. We're here all the time. It's a big part of the you are here on the map, right? It's the trailhead as we are introduced to sin and rebellion. This is us breaking out. And this is where I've expanded on Walky. He didn't use this distinction. I had a vocabulary lesson that day and I saw this distinction. So I'm adapting his work and I'm looking and I'm saying, okay, well then there's a rhythm here. There's an exchange that God forcefully and suddenly breaks in and brings order. And what do we do? We forcefully and suddenly and often break out. And that's Genesis chapter 3. Where we break out of order and reintroduce chaos to what God has ordered. So let's think about that. When you think about something that's formless and you look at a void and you're going to think about speaking into that chaos to bring order, what do you think about Well, you think about lines, you you think about limits, you think about boundaries, edges, where God's dividing things from things, he's separating light from darkness, he's separating land from sea, he's he's distinguishing between humanity and the rest of the animal kingdom. This is order, he's structuring it, he's he's, he's revealing limits, he's marking out boundaries and and edges, and and he's putting everything in its appropriate place, and he's sorting, and and this is how this works with that, and this is how this works with that. He's ordering. When we break out, we remove distinction. We just muddle it all up again, and we get rid of limits, and we get rid of boundaries, and we get rid of all of these distinctions. Do you see that happening in the world around us today? Sin and rebellion will always result in blurred lines. It will always result in a removing of the kind of order that God brought. That's what it is by nature. 
And so here on Sanctity of Human Life Sunday, you think about the distinction between man and animal, for example, that that you look around in a world around us as they're looking at the map and charting their course, and they've determined that no life is of greater value than any other life. God said that men and women, the only thing in all creation that was created in His image And all through the covenant and law, there were different repercussions and consequences for taking human life. All of these others I have given you for food. You are not an animal. You are a human being and a bearer of God's image. Distinction. But we remove those distinctions. Sin and rebellion removes those distinctions. And so as Tyler has already said on, here on Sanctity of Human Life Sunday, that, that you look in, in a world that sees no distinction, therefore there's, it's just tissue. We don't need it. Okay. It's the removal of distinction. This is not a political statement for us, though it might work its way out politically. It is theological first. It is theological first. God created men and women in his image with a dignity, a value, and worth that nothing else on this planet shares. Nothing. And he created you with that capacity. Why? Because he desires to have a relationship with you that's altogether distinct from everything else in, the, in, in all creation. He created you with the capacity to share a relationship with him as the creator of everything. Like that should blow your mind. You've got to be created with just enough capacity. Why? So he can be a friend of yours. That is humbling and marvelous. Humbling and marvelous. That's why we are pro-human life. It is theological first before it's political. Okay? But sin removes those distinctions between man and animal. Sin removes distinction between men and women with regards to gender and gender identity, between husband and wife, with regards to family and sexuality, between good and evil, etc., etc., etc. We forcefully and suddenly break out and reintroduce chaos to what God has ordered, where he had originally broke in forcefully and suddenly and brought order. We disrupted it with sin and rebellion. So I, I, I said this, where it could be said, as I quote Dr. Wolke, that God erupted into chaos to establish his rule over everything. I've adapted that and said it could also then be said that Genesis 3, that in Genesis 3, man erupted with an E out of order to establish his rule over everything. And now you have two kingdoms. Two kingdoms, two families, two completely different worldviews. They value different things. They structure themselves differently. Uh, it's, it's not the same. It'll never fit. And so it doesn't matter how much effort you put to it. Uh, it's never going to fit. And I think increasingly sh- so. What do I mean? As you grow in the Lord, it stands to biblical theological reason that the world will fit less and less and less and less and less the more you mature in Christ. If the world fits, feels like it fits, uh, something's off. So the world needs to, as we continue to mature in Christ, it's going to naturally feel more and more and more uncomfortable and more and more and more like it's not our home. Does that make sense? Okay, that's the idea. So is there any wonder why our culture is so confused on issues pertaining to life and human dignity? No, it's, it's no wonder. Is it any wonder why we're so confused on gender? Nope. That makes sense to me. It's the removal of distinction. Okay, that's always been the way it's been. Okay. Any wonder why there are issues related to manhood versus womanhood? Don't talk about the differences between men and women. You'll get yourself in trouble. They're no different. They're functionally the same. Um, Indignity and worth, yeah, because you're an image bearer of God absolutely every day, all day. 
But God created men and women different on purpose to serve different purposes and serve different roles to complement one another so that what? So that God could establish his reign and rule on earth and we would all experience the shalom that his kingdom was meant to bring. And men and women with their particular strengths were created in such a way that they would complement one another and bring peace. That's the economy of God. That is not the economy of the world. And for you young people, I see you guys all sitting up there. <laughs> for your generation, this, this will be a strong contention as you head into college. This is, a, this is under direct attack. And so listen to me. Look me in the eyes right now. This is the trailhead. This is your origin story. You, you, stray, you stray from this, you get from this, and then all of a sudden the world's going to start making sense. You're going to go, oh, okay. You're going to leave that over there and you're going to, oh, okay, tell me more about that. And you're going to get further and further and further away. And that's what they're going to do. They're gonna, come over here, come here, come here, come here. And they're going to pull you further and further and further and further away from a story God gave you to tell you who you are. Okay, lecture over. That's not in my notes. But I see you sitting up there and I can help myself. Okay. The, the, again, you cannot overemphasize the importance of this book. It's the trailhead. And studies show, and this was from 10 years ago. I don't know if, I, I don't know if this study has been updated, but good night. Only 51% of pastors, a study showed in the U.S., only 51% of pastors were Bible-believing 10 years ago. What on earth? I don't even understand that number. And it has to do with how we view Scripture and the nature of Scripture. <sighs> okay. That's the theme predominantly I, I, I want to make sure we pick up again so that we can take that with us, blow the dust off it, and take it with us back into the study. But I'll just show you real quick, and I'll just rattle them off, how this interaction, this rhythm of God erupting with an I and us erupting with an E and him responding and erupting with an I and us responding by erupting with an E just continues through the Genesis narrative up through the first 11 chapters and then on into Abraham's life. Let's just, let's just do that. You see the same rhythm with Adam and Eve, of course. They, they broke out and God erupted with an I again, cursed them and removed them from his presence, removed them from the garden. They are now enemies and no longer friends. Uh, to use biblical languages, we're now enemies, we are hostile to God, and so we were moved from his presence. Cain and Abel, their sons, it was no different. Cain got jealous of Abel uh, for a variety of reasons. You can go look, and he kills his brother. He rebels, he breaks out, and he takes things in his own hands to establish his own reign and rule. God steps in, judges him, casts him further east. He, he marks him and sends him out. And this image of further east is kind of a metaphor of us getting further and further and further away from the garden. Just move him further out. Moved his parents out of the garden, then he killed his brother, he moved further east. Same rhythm can be found in the flood narrative in Genesis 6 through 9. Genesis 6, 5 says this, The Lord saw the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Ugh. Only evil continually. That was it. And so as what Jeffries calls a decreation, God erupted with an I to that eruption with an E. He erupted with an I and, and, and wiped the slate Clean. He sent the flood, wiped everybody out. What Jeffries calls a decreation, that God in that moment at the flood decreated to recreate. And we see that where Noah is given the same covenant that Adam and Eve. Noah is told, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. Same thing Adam and Eve were told. It's like Noah's the new Adam. But you, you barely get a chapter into that story and he's drunk, passed out, naked in a tent. So he, it doesn't take long and he erupts with an E too and you're back to nakedness and sin just like in Genesis 3. So it just, the rhythm just keeps going. But God continues to stay the course. He's going to see us to the other side. And we're not going to get there because we're so smart. We're going to get there because he is so gracious and he's determined. And when a sovereign God is determined, that's, that, 
It's going to work out well for you, even if it'll be hard for you. It'll work out well for you, okay? Tower of Babel, Genesis 11. Uh, this is fascinating to me. God tells Adam and Eve to be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. Then he wipes the slate clean, tells Noah, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. Then you have nakedness and sin, as I just mentioned. And then this in verse 1 of chapter 11. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, look at this, come. Let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves lest what? Lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. Wait a second. What did God tell you to do two different times? To be fruitful and multiply and what? And fill the earth. And now you're saying, instead of doing that, and lest we be dispersed over the face of the earth, let's just stay here and let's build a tower with its top in the heavens and let's make a name for ourselves. Whose rule is that about? Is that about establishing God's reign on earth? No, no, no. That's all about establishing our rule on earth and making a name for ourselves. That's an eruption with an E. And so God erupts with an I. And he comes down, if you remember, and he confuses their language. They don't get along. So they, they start dispersing all over the face of the earth. Interesting. That God comes down, erupts with an I, and gets done what he had already called them to do. And the theme repeats itself over and over and over again. Turn to Genesis chapter 5. I want you to see this. And I, I, I don't think this is reading too much into it. I find this um, quite fascinating, the, the difference in language. But I want to show you in Genesis chapter 5, um, after Noah, the 10 generations leading up to Abraham, I want you to see the language and how it's recorded. Look at Genesis chapter 5. I'm going to leave you for just a couple of seconds. I want you to just look. What do you see repeated at the end of every paragraph? What do you see? Okay. You're going to talk about who had what son, and, 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 and then he had that son, and over and over and over. The mantra reads like a funeral procession. It's like, and he died, and he had a son, and then he died, and then that guy had a son, and then he died. It's just like, ugh. And then Noah, and he wipes everybody out. Look at Genesis chapter 11. After the Babel story. Look at verse 10. Do the same thing. Just look at those paragraphs through that genealogy. What do you see different? And had other sons and daughters, and then he had a son had other sons and daughters and, and then other sons and daughters. Multiplication, life. God had charted a course and he was going to keep it even if we would not. So he continues to erupt with an I even while we continually, and we're really good at it, erupt with an E. And we do that over and over and if you're honest, you do too. You look back over your own history and go, man, look at me breaking out sort, suddenly and forcefully to establish my rule over everything over and over and over again. And what has God faithfully done for you is His goodness has been running after you. He's erupting with an eye over and over and over again because He is determined and He is sovereign. So na, 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 na. Oh, that is a na, 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 na that brings me a lot of peace. So that continues. It continues again and again, and you see it in every story. You see the eruption with an E, us breaking out. You see God responding with such grace, such goodness, such mercy, such kindness as he breaks in to establish his rule. And that continues over and over and over again. And that's the first 11 chapters. And then chapter 12. Look at chapter 12. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house into the land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse 
And look at this. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, this is in direct contrast to chapter 11 in the Tower of Babel story where they sought to make their, a great name for themselves. God calls Abram, Abraham, Abram at the time, from among the nations of the world now. So 11 is about the origin of the nations. And then God picks one family, one man from among all of the other families of the earth. And he was living in Mesopotamia. He was worshiping a moon god. I mean, this was not a God-fearing man. He was a pagan idolater. And God calls Abram from among all the other nations of the world. And he says, and through you, this one family, I'm going to make sure to bless all the families. Here's something American Christians have got to get into their head. God has never one time taken his eye off the nations, not once. There is a tendency in American conservative evangelicalism to sort of elevate American Christianity, white Christianity, and it's just biblically wrong. God has never one time taken his eyes off the nations. What he did was, as he dispersed the nations over the face of the earth, he then immediately took one man from among those nations and set up the same economy he had with Adam and Eve so that one day through him, all families of the earth would be blessed. He never took his eyes off of the nations. And I'll tell you this. American evangelicalism is very, very toxic um, and it's producing something and multiplying something that, it, that is not good for our country and it's not good for Christianity. It's just not. It is very American-centered. I'm going to tell you, if you studies show as missiologists are studying where God is moving and where people are getting saved and baptized and where churches are planting, guess where the, 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 that is happening in the world today? S South. In the southern hemisphere, in all these places, we ride off. God is moving where people are hungry and they're getting saved and churches are being planted. Look, at, we have a tendency to be more like the people at Babel, where we tend to, in our country, in our affluent country, we tend to build up instead of out. And when we build up it, to establish our own reign and rule over everything, what does God do? He confuses the language and he breaks it down and he disperses them over the face of the earth. Church, listen to me. Um, this has been a hard season for us. I'm just going to say it. It has been painful. It has been excruciatingly painful. It has been a long two years for a variety of reasons, some external, some internal, but it has been painful. This is the thing I'm holding on to right now, that even when God seems to confuse our language and part us from one another and disperse people over the face of the earth, that he's doing it because he's charted a course. And if I hang on, then he'll keep me. That God, if you're breaking something down that needs to be broken down, then break it down and bring me to that. Adapt me to that. Discipline me to that. Don't let me hang on and keep my towers. Do you want to keep your towers? So I'm hanging on to that, that God, this feels like chaos again. Yeah. And you brought it on. Oh. I'm erupting in to bring order and to restore and to renew. And so that is my hope for us. For us, specifically here at Valley Life, and for us as the American church, as we, we've, got to start, we've got to start letting this be the trailhead and not some historical document. This is the trailhead. This is the trailhead. The other historical documents we have, okay, wherever you want to say they were formed from, I'm saying they came after this is all I'm saying. This is the trailhead. This guides the church wherever it is in the world. Those in agreement said. I, I hope that's a resounding amen. Because everything else is just towers. Everything else is just towers. Okay. That's not my notes. I don't have time for that. Okay. Let me do this. I'm out of time. In chapters 12, so he picks Abram from among the families of the earth, and then he makes a covenant with him, and something happens there that's very, very important, and then 
and, 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 and we begin to see it sort of play out through the rest of Scripture. And so that Genesis 12 is big. It's, not, it's another one of those high watermarks, okay? The call of Abram is big. And Abram is recognized in the New Testament as being the father of faith. Like he's most recognized for his great, great faith. Here's what chapters 12 through 18 show us and even on up to 22, which we'll see because that's ahead of us. Is that for all his great faith... Abram was not without his lapses of. So he leaves his father and country, leaves his pagan gods, leaves it all behind to follow this God, which to him at the time was unknown. And he follows him blindly into the, to the horizon to show him where he was going to live and dwell. And he just does it. Wow, great faith. I mean, truly, that's remarkable. And then by the rest of chapter 12, he's freaked out that someone's going to kill him and take his wife. So he tells his wife to lie that she's really his sister. And maybe that way he'll, I'll get a bride price because he'll want to pursue you and blah, blah, blah. I can get rich off of endangering my wife. Real high watermark for him. And then he gets afraid during a famine and he flees again. Like he has peaks and valleys like you have peaks and valleys. You can look back at your life and go, man, I'm really proud of myself. The God did a work there. I'm excited. And then you can look back at your life and go, hey, what was that? I do the same thing as a pastor. I can look back and over the last near 16 years or whatever it's been for Valley Life and God has done a lot of things that I'm still to this day very proud of. Use people to do crazy stuff. But it's Valley Life Church. It didn't just have peaks, apparently. There's some valleys, too. and something, There's some things I would want to do different if I had the opportunity. And there are things that have happened that I wish didn't happen that were painful and hurtful and recent and so we're still trying to work it out. And God faithfully has charted a course. And Abraham's story doesn't look much different than ours. Peaks and valleys and I'm glad for that. I'm glad for that. So that continues. I, oh, I'm going to do it. I know that I, I should have brought this out earlier. I did first service. I forgot second. So it's not meant to be some sort of dramatic reveal, but um, <clears throat> I just forgot. I did, so I drew a quick diagram during our study of Ephesians that I think is going to be really important for us too. So I want to take that with us, if that's okay. Um, this is something that really looks at the economy of God in a very simple way, but helps us understand the nature of covenant. And the covenant of, of Abraham is what we step back into, so this will be helpful. Let me do this real quick. This will only take a couple minutes. In the way that God ordered things, God erupted into chaos, right? To, to establish his rule over everything. And so he created humanity in his image to subdue and have dominion over the, all the earth, to be his human representatives to establish his rule over everything. Okay, that's the order. And then he put us in a place. So God has a people in a place. And in Genesis 1 and 2, it was the garden. Later on with Abraham, it's going to be what? It's going to be Canaan, it's going to be the promised land, and that's going to be thematic through the Old Testament, up through Moses and Joshua, and up through the kings, and so on. So there's always, there's a motif in the Old Testament of, of land, seed, and blessing. So when the seed, God's people, his line, his family, in their land, if they lived according to the order that God established, what was the promise? Blessing, or you can think about it like shalom or peace, that as the kingdom of God functions and he establishes his rule, that rule is meant to produce peace. And we live in harmony with one another and, and the fruit and the benefit and the blessing of all of that. What happens if you remember from Genesis, I only brought this up incidentally, it wasn't a big thing, so maybe you weren't here, but 
Genesis chapter 3 then is our eruption where we broke out, right? We blew that whole thing up. And when we blew that whole thing up, what happened? Well, God is now enemies with his, this rebellious people, so they're removed from the garden, and they lose proximity, and instead of blessing, what do they get? Yeah, they get cursed. This economy continues through the Old Testament. Deuteronomy has large portions of scripture. This is what it looks like when you live according to my covenant. This is what it's going to look like if you, if you rebel and you disobey and you don't live according to the terms of the covenant. So this is what God does with Abraham. Okay? Uh, let me see if I can just put this down here and keep that up here. This is what then God does. I want you to see that he establishes the same thing only just with one family with his eyes on the nations. So here's the economy that we broke up, right? You got people down here, you got the cosmos here, and you still have God up here. Well, what God did, we blew things up, and so he's erupting with an eye back in to bring order to what we totally screwed up. He picks one family, and he sets up the same economy. He calls Abe, <laughs> calls Abram. He talks about the promised land. There's a land, go to a land I will tell you. And then the relationship is, if you live according to this plan, you will be blessed. And in you, all of the families of the earth will be blessed as God rebuilds and restores what was established in the beginning with his people, all tribes and tongues around the throne in Revelation, right? 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 Worshiping one God, all tribes, all tongues are out, right? All families of the earth. Where? In the new heavens and the new earth. Isn't that New Testament language? Okay, guys. This is one story. God is doing one thing. He's charted a singular course. And he is going to see it to the other end. And that's going to work out really well for his children of faith. Even while we continue to have our peaks and valleys. And this is ultimately fulfilled in Christ because he's the perfect Adam. He's the only one who could live sinlessly according to the law. He's the only one that merited the blessing that we now receive by faith. <sighs> and Jesus said in Revelation, what did he say? Behold, I am making all things new. Notice it's not anything different than what he established in Genesis 1 and 2. Same economy. It's just now renewed. It's renewed where? At the blazing center of the gospel, which is the cross of Christ. As he pays for our eruptions with an E, with the ultimate eruption with an I, God setting aside his glory to step into humanity, to become like us, that he might die for us, for our eruption, he ends up taking that upon himself and suffering the curse. He became the curse for us, Galatians said. He was cursed because of our eruption with an E so that we might receive the blessing that he received because he's the only one who ever lived without sin. Do you, are, do you see that? Okay, that's the economy. That's why we preach Jesus and have to keep doing it and we do it a lot. And, and praise God, um, our church believes that. Through this whole restore process as we're aiming towards Vision Sunday on February 20th where we're going to kind of unpack what this process has been like and put it to a rest. And this is where we feel like God is calling us. That's coming. Put that date on a calendar. But I'm looking to that and go, man, that's one thing that this church believes in nearly unanimously that Jesus is loud here. <sighs> of all the other things we've got to work out, I'm glad, I'm glad we're there. He's the blazing center. We've got to keep preaching Jesus. And then we will get to see the fulfillment of all the families in the earth being blessed through Abraham. It's awesome. So we step back into the story. And if I can take just a couple more minutes, this isn't in my notes, but this morning, I told you that I racked my brain trying to remember why we stepped away in 2019 at Easter and never came back until 2020. I didn't under... And I looked at the calendar. I tried to figure out why. And it, as I was looking at my notes again before first service, it dawned on me. 
I don't want to overplay this. I know I have a tendency towards shame. And I, okay, but I, I want to bring it up to you because it was like an aha moment for me. I remember, I, I remember after Easter saying this. And I'm not sure how that played in through the summer. It, we just celebrated Easter and the resurrection. I don't want to pick up Genesis with where we left off because we just had a, a big celebratory weekend. And what was next in Genesis? Sodom and Gomorrah. And I remember not wanting to take, to just immediately shift from that place of celebration and, and step right back into this fire and brimstone. And after the last two years... I had a moment this morning where I was like, man, I should have preached. I should have preached the fire of Sodom. That maybe I was afraid of a message of the fear of the Lord and the consequence of sin and its destructive power. I don't know. I feel some shame about that. And I'll work it out between me and the Lord on how much of that is something that was done wrong and or something that the enemy's just going to beat me up over. But when it dawned on me this morning, that was the reason. How do I step back into a study where we left off on Sodom and Gomorrah? Well, we're going to find out next week, I guess, because that's what's next. Okay? It's a journey, guys. This is real. This isn't a folk tale. If you're a Christian, this is your story. If you're a part of this church, this is our story. And it's bigger than we think, I think. Let's stand together. Mm-hmm.